fairly easy consequence of the theorem of Christian Journet that we'd already proved the T1 theorem for square functions. You get the singular intervals from the square functions. Okay? All right. So now, from almost immediately, well, almost immediately in the sense that you're going to do it as an exercise. Uh, <laughs> I hope it's not too bad. Um, so, some corollaries. Okay, um, let's recall the definition of the, of the Calderon commutators, all right? We had these operators C, A, K, F of X is defined to be, I'm gonna run out of room there, so let me write it here. One over two pi I, principal value, integral on the line of um, one over X minus Y, A of X, minus a of y over x minus y to the k, f of y dy, with a Lipschitz. Okay? Notice that we can also consider the case k equals zero. In that case, we just have a, a Hilbert transform with a slightly different constant. Usual Hilbert transform constant is one over pi. Okay? All right. So the theorem is, uh, the numerology is 325. This is originally due to Calderon. There exists some constant C1, a universal constant. All right. Such that these colorful commutators are bounded on L2 with L2 operator norm. less than or equal to C1 to the K times, of course, the Lipschitz constant to the K. Of course, that's just, that's just homogeneity, right? You have to pick up the Lipschitz constant to the K power. All right? And that's, that's an exercise. You prove it using the T of 1 theorem. It's an induction argument. This is one of your exercises. Okay. So maybe just, I'll just give you a heuristic. Let's take the k equals one case. Okay. So remember that that the first commutator it really is a commutator. It's the derivative, at least formally, it's the derivative operator composed with H, and then you take the, called, uh, the commutator with the operator of multiplication with the Lipschitz function A. Okay, so if we apply one to the, or if we apply this to the constant function one, this becomes what? This being by the definition of the commutator, this is d by dx h of a times one minus a times d by dx of h of one, but that's zero. All right, uh, but also the derivative commutes with h, well, except, I don't know, I have a constant, sorry. Let me do it this way. Uh, I think 2i, okay, and then this is a true statement. So the derivative commutes with the Hilbert transform, 
and this is just H of A prime. But we know the Hilbert transform is bounded in L2. A is Lipschitz, so A prime is in L infinity. So this is in BMO by Petrie Span Stein. And then you're done because this is an anti-symmetric kernel, so weak boundedness is immediate. And T star is just negative of T. So if, if T of 1 is in BMO, then and you have anti-symmetry, then so is T star of 1. Okay? So then it's just an immediate application of, of the T of 1 theorem. Well, except that you need to justify these manipulations. All right? Okay? And so the way you justify the manipulations, one way to justify the manipulations is to smoothly truncate the kernel here, introduce a smooth truncation, integrate by parts, you get bounds independent of the truncation, and then you play an induction game, reducing the k plus one order commutator applied to one to the kth order commutator applied to, to a prime. Okay, modulo some errors that you get from the truncation. All right, and you prove a bound independent of the truncation. So that's how the, the exercise works. Okay. And as an immediate corollary of that, we have, this is, in the notes, this is called theorem 326, which is that um, if the Lipschitz constant of A is strictly less than one over C1, where C1 is that C1, then the Cauchy integral operator, right, written the graph coordinate parameterized version, CA, is bounded on L2, okay? And the proof of this is just using the fact, as we observed earlier on the first day, that CA is the sum, K runs from zero to infinity, of negative one times C A, uh, negative one to the K times C A K. All right, and now you just sum the Neumann series because you get, you get convergence here if the Lipschitz constant is less than this, strictly less than this constant C1, okay? Now, it was interesting that Calderon actually, this, he was working on this problem well before the advent of the T of 1 theorem, so he didn't have this technology available. Um, and his argument actually reverses the order. He proves this by hand, and then from that you get the other thing. Okay, but T of 1 makes things a little easier. In fact, it makes it a lot easier. <clears throat> okay. But now, of course, We'd like to do more than just have to be restricted to this small Lipschitz constant case. And in fact, the theorem is true in general for an arbitrary Lipschitz function. The, color, uh, the Cauchy integral operator is bounded on L2 for any, any Lipschitz graph A, or uh, for any Lipschitz function A, okay? Um, that's a theorem of, well, a very famous theorem of Coifin, Macintosh, and Mayer. We will at least we will prove it, maybe modulo a little bit of uh, waving my hands and leaving you to check the notes, okay? Um, but the first, the way, we're gonna, the way we're gonna approach that theorem is via an extension of the T of 1 theorem called the T of B theorem, okay? So where somehow um, you can increase, you can generalize the class of testing functions that you work with not just the constant function one, but, but more general functions that have some non suitable non-degeneracy property. Okay, so we need a definition. So we say that a function B in L infinity of Rn is accretive if there exists some positive constant delta 
such that the real part of B is always bounded from below by delta. Okay? So it's bounded above because it's an L infinity, but the real part is bounded below. All right? And similarly, we have that B, an L infinity function B is pseudo accretive if there exists a standard mollifier PT and a constant delta such that the modulus of PT of B is always bigger than or equal to delta. Yes, this is uniform in T. Yes, thank you. Uniform in T. And finally, we say that B is dyadic pseudo-accretive if, again, uniformly in T, AT of B is bigger than or equal to delta in modulus, where AT is the dyadic averaging operator. Meaning what? Meaning that AT f of x is by definition the average over a cube Q of x t, I'll explain what that is in a second, of f. Where Q of x t is the unique half open dyadic cube containing x with side length, at, the minimal one with side length at least t. In other words, with length of q, oh, q of x t over 2 less than t less than or equal to length of q of x t. Okay? So it's the unique minimum size dyadic cube with side length at least t which contains x. Okay? So in other words, we're averaging at a scale, at a dyadic scale that's comparable to t. All right? Oh, by the way, I haven't apologized for this notation. It's not my fault. It's just part of the literature. We use Qs two different ways. Qs are cubes, and Qs are also these littlewood Paley operators. Uh, yeah, it's just convention in the subject. I hope that's not too confusing. Subscript QT, the subscript T is always going to be the operator. All right, otherwise it's going to be a cube. Okay? Um, notice that accretivity, the pointwise accretivity implies either pseudo-accretivity or dyadic pseudo-accretivity and also dyadic pseudo-accretivity. For example, what's um, because the absolute value of B, PT of B is bigger than or equal to the real part of PT of B, but PT has a real kernel, okay? The, the convolution kernel here is a, real, is a real valued kernel. So this is the same as PT of the real part of B, which is bounded below by delta, and the integral of PT is one, so. P, and I should say, it. Uh, 
I should emphasize that we're here taking the kernel to be non-negative with phi t bigger than or equal to zero. Okay? All right, similarly for at. All right? On the other hand, maybe it's also worth mentioning that that it's not enough to have um, to simply assume that the absolute value is bounded from below. The absolute value or the modulus of B is bounded from below. Uh, think, of a, think of a complex exponential. All right, where the modulus is one, but when you average it out, you're getting a lot of cancellation, okay? All right, so somehow, when you're talking about pointwise accurativity, the lower bound on the real part is, is saying something stronger than just lower bound on the modulus, okay? All right, so now, that brings us To the next theorem, which is a so-called T of B theorem for square functions. And this is due to SEMS. Okay, it's a T of B theorem because, as you might guess, Instead of testing on the constant function one, we're going to test on some b, and the b is going to be accretive, or say pseudo-accretive, okay? So the theorem says the following. Let theta t f of x be defined to be integral of psi t of x, y, f of y, dy, where psi t again, is a little with Paley family. All right? And suppose suppose that there exists at least a pseudo-accredit function such that the measure, the n plus one dimensional measure d mu of x t defined to be theta t of b of x squared dx dt over t is a Carlson measure. Okay? Then the conclusion is that, once again, the theta t's give rise to a bounded square function. Okay? And the constant C, of course, is going to depend on the allowable stuff. Okay, so where C is going to depend on dimension, the Littlewood Paley constants for psi t. Uh, of course, the Carlson norm of mu um, and the L infinity norm of mu and also the constant delta in the accretivity condition, okay, or pseudo-accretivity condition. All right? So, maybe just before we prove it, just a brief remark. Of course, the natural thing is to compare to theorem I think 3.1, which is the T of 1 theorem for square functions, the Chris Jornet theorem. Okay, so 
This actually turns out to be a special case of this one, right? If you take B to be one, of course that's accretive, okay? So this is actually a special case of this theorem. All right. So before we prove it, maybe one more remark also. Um, we proved T of one theorems for both square functions and for singular integrals. And in fact, it is indeed true that there is also a T of B theorem for singular integrals. That's harder to prove, we don't have time to do it. Um, there's some comments about it in the notes, but we, no details. Um, for our purposes, this is going to be enough, and this is actually not going to be a hard theorem, given what we've already done, okay? This is due to David Journet and Sims, but we won't, we won't take time to talk about this, all right? Okay, so how do we prove this T of B theorem for square functions, all right? Well, the proof is gonna go via reduction to the T of one theorem for square functions. We're gonna reduce matters to theorem 3.1. In other words, what do we need to show? We already know that we're given a Littlewood-Paley family of kernels. So, it's enough to show show that theta t of one of x squared dx dt over t is a Carlson measure, right? Because then the conditions of the, of the t of one theorem for square functions are verified, and we just get the square function bound from that, okay? So somehow the idea is to control this guy by this thing that we know is a Carlson measure. We're going to control the Carlson norm of that by, the Carl by this Carlson norm. Okay? Somehow. Okay? All right. And this is where we use the pseudo recursivity. All right? Since PT of B, the real part, or sorry, the modulus, is bigger than or equal to delta, therefore, theta T of 1 is pointwise bounded by one over delta times theta t of one of x times pt of b of x, okay? Okay. So therefore, if we fix a cube Q and try to verify the Carlson condition on that cube, and one over the measure of Q, integral from zero to length of Q, integral on Q, theta T of one of X squared DX DT over T is less than or equal to one over delta squared, one over the measure of Q, Integral from zero to length of Q. Integral of Q of theta T of one times PT of B squared DX DT over T. All right, and we have two minutes and I think that will be enough. Okay, 
So now we use a familiar trick, this idea of Koifenmeier. Okay, so we write theta t of one times pt of b as theta t of one times pt minus theta t, all applied to b, plus theta t of b. So now the contribution of this guy is okay by hypothesis, right? Because we're assuming that theta t of b gives us a Carlson measure. All right? And now what about this part? Let's call this rt. And what you notice about rt, because pt of 1 is 1, this is kind of a familiar thing by now, we note that rt of 1 is 0. And also, the kernel of rt also satisfies the lewitt paley conditions. Okay, so now you just invoke the Pfefferman-Stein lemma, which you did as an exercise. And you get that RT of B as a Carlson measure. Okay? In fact, you can even control in terms of the BMO norm of B, but you don't even need something that strong. You just need the l infinity norm of B. Okay, so then you conclude RT B squared dx dt over T is a Carlson measure by the Pfefferman-Stein lemma, which I think was theorem 222, I believe. Okay, and then we're done. Okay, so that's a good place to stop. Any questions? No? Okay, thanks. We got one more tomorrow. See you then.